Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. It's the last episode of the growing season. If you're thinking about starting a garden next spring, now is a good time to start preparing the soil. Also, we're answering viewer questions. That's just ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mr. Day. Howdy. Good to have you, Mr. Day. It's great. Great day to be outside, man. It's beautiful. Nice night. day. Wonderful day. day. Guess what we're going to do today? We're going to play in the dirt. We're going to have a good time. Yeah. You ready for it? I'm ready. All right. I'm ready. We also did our soil test, right? We, we did. Talk we about did soil the right test. thing. We, we practiced what we preach. That's right. right? So what, what does it look like? Well, it looks pretty good. You know, we, we, we did the soil test this time. This time of the year is a good time to do okay. the soil test, even though this is not the time of the year to apply fertilizer. Okay. Uh, however, it is the time of the year to apply lime. Any time is the time to apply lime if you need it. So the main reason we went ahead and uh, checked the soil here is to try to determine whether or not we needed to adjust the pH any. Okay. Well, the pH <laughs> is 7.83, so oh, it's yeah. very high. We it's definitely high. do not need any lime. We have uh, almost 5,000 pounds of calcium per acre out here, which That's is plenty. highly sufficient, That's plenty. highly sufficient. Mm -hmm. But we do know now that we've done the soil test that next spring, when we, before we plant the garden, we need to apply 15 pounds of triple 15 per thousand square feet. Okay. Now we've measured this uh, and it is 25 feet long and 20 feet wide. Okay. So it just happens to be exactly 500 right square feet. Right. So we know that next spring we'll need to apply seven and a half pounds of triple 15 over this area okay. for vegetables. All That's right. what we need. Um, so uh, I think what we're gonna do this year, the upper part, to my right is fairly dry. Mm -hmm. And so we are going to go ahead and apply some soil amendments okay. to that soil to open it up a little bit. This is 50% uh, cotton burr right. and 50% leaf, leaf litter, I understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're gonna put about three inches, a three inch cover and till it into the soil on the upper part. The lower part is really too wet for us to do anything with. And so we're gonna, it's gonna be a test. We're gonna put our soil amendments out here in the fall on half of this 500 square feet. This lower half on the left, we're gonna leave it and let it just lay here all winter. Ah. And, and, and then we're going to uh, apply uh, the soil amendments here, you know, next spring, uh, early next spring okay. before we plant. Now, what we've done to this area already, about 10 days ago, we uh, sprayed this area with glyphosate. Mm -hmm. The grass didn't completely turn brown. Mm -hmm. it, it yellowed right. up a little bit. And the reason is glyphosate is a systemic herbicide, you, you know, uh -huh. and yeah. it works best when plants are actively growing. Right. Well, in the last couple of weeks, we've had some cool nights and, and, and uh, some cool weather. And so and the Bermuda grass, and the right. grass is kind of shutting down a little bit. It's still dead. Right. I mean, it, 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 the, the plant had taken up the glyphosate and so it's still dead. So you don't have to wait until it's completely brown if you do that, to, you know, apply it this time of the year. Okay. Then we went in here and tilled it yesterday, I think, is when we tilled it. Okay. And, okay. Uh, and that's when we discovered that this is a little too wet to, yeah. to do anything <laughs> to. So, uh, uh, so that's what we've done so far. So I think what we're ready to do now is start applying this cotton burr and leaf litter mix. Yeah. Uh, we're going to try to. Good, huh? It looks really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks really yeah. good. It ought to, it ought to, I mean, organic matter on this soil was. Uh, 2.61 percent so you know we would like to this will get it on up there if okay. we can get to five or six percent that would really really be good mm -hmm. uh, but we did learn that our phosphorus levels and potassium levels are medium which which is good, it's good. Yeah. Uh, uh, if, if we go with this triple 15 every year we will eventually have extremely high levels of phosphorus <laughs> so that's why we're gonna we're gonna follow this soil test report for about three or four years. And then we're gonna retest. And at that time, I predict the recommendation will change from triple 15 to 13-0-13 or 15-0-15. Hmm. I predict we will have built 
the levels of potassium up high enough that we won't need to add potassium. Okay. And if we do that for three, two or three years, that level will come down, and then we'll have to go with the balanced fertilizer again. Right. So, but if we could, it's, why it's very important to soil test. That's right. And, and and not every year. You don't have to do it every year. You know, this will last three or four years. Three or four years. But, th but then we need to we need to redo it. And um, we're gonna hold you to those predictions. We're gonna okay. see how good you are. Write it down. Write, Write it down. down. All okay. Right. All right. So are we ready to to uh, do a little uh, tilling and and I'm ready. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, uh, we're uh, going to dump this soil amendment out here. We want to spread it about three inches thick over this, but there's no need to take a shovel and sling this out. We're going to just dump it. I've got a rake, and we're going to spread it, and we'll check it every few inches, a few feet, and make sure it's about three inches thick. I think that'll do it. You think that'll do it? I think it will. All right. Well, we look like we've done a real good job. We've yeah. got a, about a three inch cover of this soil amendment out here and I'm about to crank up our <laughs> machine here. We've got horsepower. All right. <laughs> or crank this thing up and see if I can mix this in a little bit with the soil. Why did you go in different directions? Better mix it. Better mix it? Mix it better. All right. Keep it, and it, ideally, uh, you go hit it again. Okay. You want to mix it as good as you can. Right. And uh, if you kept going in the same direction, you might have the same ridges and all that. Okay. Why do you mow a yard in different directions? Oh, my grass is stand up. Huh? Right. Yeah, and also your, your wheel. Yeah, you're not going to compact it and, and all that. Right. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think? Pretty good, it's pretty good shape, just like that. But I'd probably hit it one more time long ways, you know. All right, yeah, that's good though. And I'm, you noticed I, I picked it up a little bit, mm -hmm. coming back and it, and I noticed that. kind of neaten it up a little, level it up a little bit, that's what I'm trying to do. Mr. D, we appreciate you doing that for oh, us. Oh man, most welcome. All right. We'll see what it looks like. We'll see if we see any difference next year in the car. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Yeah, I can't wait to see what it looks like next year. Yep. All right. Thanks so much, yeah. man. All right, man. All right. Take care. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. All right, Mr. D, we have a lot of viewer questions. They're good questions. Yes, they are. Are you ready for them? Let's do it. All right, let's do it. Here's our first viewer email. Should I do a separate soil test in different areas of my yard? And this is from Ms. Bethany in Jackson. So different areas of my yard she wants to do soil tests. What do you think about that? It depends. It depends. So I thought. It, d it depends on how big your yard is. Mm -hmm. If it's more than 10 acres, <laughs> you do. You need to do, uh, you know, because the soil test, if the soil conditions are the same, well, you can sample up to 10 acres right. of one sample. Uh, if you have, if in your yard you know that your soil is pretty much the same all over your yard, and it probably it is, probably is right. Uh, mm -hmm. Then one sample is enough. The thing that's important to do is make sure that you list on that soil, on the form that goes in with your soil test. Right everything that you're gonna grow in That's that right. yard, and you'll get detailed directions on how to treat the soil for depending on what you're gonna grow. If you're gonna have blueberries, it's blueberries, blackberries, mm -hmm. vegetables, turf grass, you know, shrubs and ornamentals, you know, just list everything that you, you know, will grow, and you'll get instructions on how to handle that. But if, the only, the only way I can, the only reason I can think of uh, you needing more than one sample in the yard 
is if you did a lot of grading and in mm -hmm. one area of your yard, you did a lot of fill, you, you brought in a lot of topsoil and added okay. it, then you might need to do another sample for that area. But in 99% of the home lawns that I've been associated with, one sample is good enough and it'll last you three or four yeah, years, or four but years. after three or four years, you need to do that again. Right, and I would agree. I think the soils are probably going to be the same. That's right. Right, okay. So I uh, hope that helps you out, Miss Bethany. All right, here's our next viewer email. We planted some late potatoes and just began harvesting a few and have found that something is eating a lot of them. Who are we feeding? And this is from Claire, Midtown Memphis. So take a look at that, Mr. D. Yep. Who are they feeding? <laughs> you know, that looks like voles, rodents. That's, voles are the first thing that came to my yeah, mind. That's what that looks like to me. The furry yeah, little underground, in your potato, yeah. that's right. I mean, that looks like tooth prints. You know? <laughs> All right. And I've not seen any kind of insect that will no. do that kind of damage. I know there are wire worms. They're wire worms, and, right. And they're grubs, worms and right. things like that, that that will damage potatoes, but they don't do damage like that. Yeah. Those, uh, those are, mm. they're, they're doing quite a bit. I mean, uh, that's about as bad as I've ever seen. That is as bad as I've ever seen. Yeah, these are late potatoes, and of course, mm. they're in the ground, mm -hmm. and your voles are going to be hanging out. <laughs> they just think they're mighty handy, I'm sure, if you're a vole. So they just had a nice little buffet. That's what it looks like That's to me. Right. All right, so Ms. Claire, looks like voles to us, all right? That's voles like with a V. With a V, right. Voles with a V. And obviously they eat pretty good, right? Mm, right. All right, here's our next viewer email. It's fall, and my fruit trees have started to put out new leaves and are blooming. They also have this clear, sticky jelly on the limbs. What do I do about this? Will this ruin my trees? And this is from Miss Elizabeth in Mariana, Arkansas. So it's fall, fruit trees are leafing out. But she has this clear, sticky jelly. I think we know what that is, because you've talked yeah. about this before. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, the, anything that's leafing out and blooming now, uh, you know, in the fall of the year is under a lot of stress. Uh -huh. And it's, you know, trying to, uh, trying to survive. and. And it's kind of a last ditch effort, making a last ditch effort right. trying to survive. I would bet that these are either peaches, plums, or nectarines mm -hmm. or something like that. And they are probably infested with peach tree borers. Uh, if that uh, gum is coming from some of the smaller branches in the upper part of the tree, then it's the lesser peach tree borer. Okay. And, and then the um, regular peach tree bore or greater peach tree bore get, bores into the stem and trunk and lower limbs and down near the soil line right. sometimes. The lesser, or the ones in the upper part of the plant probably you know, won't kill the tree, hmm. but the ones down in the trunk can kill the tree. And the fact that the plant is blooming and leaving out right now, now. leafing out right now tells me that they're probably both of those boards are present. Well, and not a whole lot you can do about that right now. Not a lot you can do about that. I think you probably lost those streaks. Next year, wow. uh, if you uh, will spray with a, uh, an insecticide that has some residual activity uh, in uh, July, that's when the adults are, are laying eggs. Mm -hmm. You know, June and July, two or three applications, a couple of week intervals, wow. uh, that might prevent that from happening. But it's just a, it's a tough situation trying to grow uh, peach, plums, and nectarines in a, in a, a home lawn situation. Right. It's really hard to do. And what is that spray? Do you know what uh, that is? Actually, the the last one, and at the la at last time I looked, Dursban was still oh, on wow. the market. Okay. That's the commercial growers to, can still use they Dursban, still, okay. Chlorpurifos. And for homeowners, I'm not real sure. We probably need to check on that. Yeah, I think it's that. Astro, which is uh, permethrin. Okay. Yeah, permethrin. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how much residual that's got. Yeah, but, I don't know uh, how much is in there. But, but that, again, the that's not going to help you right, right now right, because right. that the borer is in that tree right now, and you're not going to get any insecticide in there. One time, there was a uh, they were trying to uh, develop a, a nematode hmm. that was a parasitic nematode that you could spray it around and, and, and inject it, kind of uh, try to get it into the tree and. And it had shown a little bit of promise, but I've not heard anything about that lately. So I don't know whether that's I have not either. I okay. don't know whether that panned out or not. I'm afraid uh -huh. it didn't. You think it sounds too good to be true? It usually is. It usually is. Yeah. All right. So there you have it, Miss Elizabeth. Might it be too good for that tree? All right. Here's our next viewer email. What do I use to kill scale on my crepe myrtle? And this is Miss Anita. In Cordova. Cordova. Yeah. So we. You can handle that, can't you? Yeah. I think we talked about this a lot. 
you know, for those crepes. Uh, here's the deal. This time of the year, I wouldn't do anything, right? Mm -hmm. I would wait until spring, and we're talking April, May, June, to treat with one of the systemic drenches, right? right? Systemic insecticide. Um, Bayer, you know, makes uh, Bayer Advance, of course, you know, makes a product that you can use that contains a midocloprid. Okay. There's another one, Safari, which mm -hmm. is dinoteferan, right. right? Which actually gets into the vascular tissue of the plant a lot quicker. It gives you the, you know, the bell-shaped burst, right. but you got to reapply. Right. You know, with the midocloprid, you have a longer-lasting residual. Yeah. But I would do that again, spring, because your plants, your trees are going to be actively taken up. Right. Nutrients and water, right? right? Is there any uh, value in the putting a dormant oil on the crepe myrtle this, in the, during the wintertime? You can do that in the wintertime with the dormant oil uh, because the thing about the crepe myrtles are this. You know, actually you can see them because the leaves are falling off so you can see the structure real good. You can see the cracks and crevices so you can actually get good coverage. Yeah. Is it 100%? No. 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 So you, you, I mean, you're still going to have to follow up with one of the drenches. Right. Right, and I know that from experience. Right, right. So you still got to do that. Yeah. Right, because again, the oils they work, but they're not. They help. 100%. Maybe help a little bit. Right. So those are the products that you're gonna have to use, Miss uh, Anita. But I wouldn't use those until late spring, early summer. All right. Is our next via email? Why or what is causing branches of my pecan tree to fall off? This is the only one of many branches that I've found on the ground that look like they have been cut. And this is from Tom and Bartlett. It's a good picture there, Mr. Tom. We know what that is. We know definitely for sure what that is. That's a, that's a pecan twig girdler. Very, very mm -hmm. common. And uh, if you have pecans or oaks or hickories or anything like that, they're, they're uh, very common. Very common. They, the adult emerges in uh, uh, late August okay. through October. So that's why we're seeing all those limbs now under the tree. Uh, the adult will start girdling on that twig, and most of them are pencil size, three eighths inch in diameter. Some of them are a little bit bigger, but most of them are from from a you know about three eighths inch in diameter. Right. And uh, she will start laying eggs. She'll lay eggs out toward the end of the twig, uh -huh. and most of those twigs will have from two to eight eggs in them. Some of them have been found to have 40 eggs in them. Oh, that's a lot. But she will girdle around that, and she won't cut it completely. And that's, a, that's a, one way you can really tell that it's the twig girdler that did it. She will leave the yeah, very little... inside uh, of that you know, twig attached to the tree, and then when a wind storm comes, it'll break it's it off. break off, right. And uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, egg will hatch, and the, the larvae will feed on that and that, and that branch that's laying there on the ground, it will feed there and then will pupate and emerge next year as an adult next August. So, to control them, right. <laughs> theoretically, you ought to be able to pick up every one of those that's right. mm -hmm. and destroy them, burn them, grind them up, or something like that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these, the adult is a longhorn wood bore, mm -hmm. about a half inch, five eighths inches long. And uh, has the, the antenna are longer yeah, than long, the body. Yeah, are yeah, longer than sure. the body of the boar. They're pretty strong flyers, so mm -hmm. they can cover territory. And uh, if you pick all these up in your yard, you need to go out in the woodlots next to you and pick them up. And you need to go to your neighbor's oh, yard and get theirs too. Right. Because, and and then even if you do that, you know probably wouldn't. You know, they're still going to fly in there. They they're going to search that. out the pecan trees, and uh, they they really like them. But there's we do not recommend spraying insecticide okay. to control them. Uh, and that's what I thought. No yeah, so just practice good sanitation, just, right? Good yeah, sanitation. Get them, get them up and don't just don't. Com this is something you don't compost. Right. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah, you don't pile them up in a brush pile for the rabbits to hide under because they will hatch <laughs> out and you'll have a lot more. You know, you'll get more and more right. and more. But uh, I can tell you that I pick all mine up and I burn all mine, and I have them every year. Hmm. I don't think I have as many as I used to have though. You know, I really don't. Okay. I mean, I, I don't think I have as many. I've had it maybe this year. I don't have as many as I've had. Right. So I, maybe I'm beginning to do some good. Yeah, yeah. But you pick them up like you just. I mentioned. pick them up, but I don't go out in the woods, oh. next to the house, and pick them up out there. And I have pecan trees out there and hickories and everything out there. So right. I'm not going to do that. So there you have it, Mr. Mm -hmm. Tom. All right. You have to practice good sanitation and pick those up. All right. Do like Mr. D is doing. You'll be fine. Yeah. All right. Here's our next via email. How do you prune grapevines? 
And this is from Richard right here in Memphis. So grapevines. What's, okay. what's the best way to prune them? You know, and when uh, do you need to prune them? You need to prune them in late winter. Ah, late okay. winter. Uh, uh, near the end of, you know, your last frost. Okay. Uh, you know, so we're talking about, you know, March 15th, right. February 15th, March 15th, you know, somewhere in that, you know, okay. uh, so it's well before your last frost, but, but late winter after the hard freezes okay. are gone, okay. after the hard freezes are gone. And uh, you never prune within 48 hours when a hard freeze is forecast. You just don't do that. Put your pruning shears up. And, uh, uh, but with grapes, Grapes fruit on current season's growth that comes from one-year-old wood. So if you keep that in mind, okay. current oh, season's good. growth out of one-year-old wood, mm -hmm. and I think all grapes do that, muscadine and bunch type. Okay. So if you go to every long vine, long runner or long cane, whatever you want to call them, and you go all the way back to where it came out of the, you know, the, the mother plant. Okay leave two, three, four, five buds and cut it off. That, all that that you're leaving is, next year will be one year old wood. Okay. Now if you cut it, if you go all the way back and you cut it off, all of it, and you severely prune it and you cut it all the way back to, to larger stems, to two year old wood, then next year all the wood you're gonna have is current season's growth out of two and three or four year old wood. How many grapes Jeez. do you think you're gonna have? Oh my goodness, none. You'll have none. Yeah. So current season's growth out of one year old wood. So you can prune it all the way back and thin them out. Some of them, you know, don't, don't leave every one of those the stub two or three inches with two or three buds on it. You know, give them six or eight inches between them, you know, open them up a little bit. Okay. And, and so some of them you take back all the way to older wood, but, but, uh, uh, the ones that you want to fruit, you know, for the, for the most part, go back and leave from two to four. With muscadines, two or three buds is plenty. Some of the bunch types, you want to leave five buds. It's easy to see and yeah. cut it. And, and you, will, you will be taking out 90% of the vine when you do that. And you're still leaving a lot of this year's wood, which next year will be one year old wood. All right. So don't fret. I mean, it, it'll come back. Right. And even yeah, it looks like it's a lot. I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And even if if you and, and if you have last year, if you if you didn't have any grapes this year because you went back and you pruned all of the old the new wood off, uh, everything that's out there now is will fruit next year. Oh, you know, if the buds that come out of what grew this year will fruit next year. So there is hope for next year. There is hope for next year. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, there you have it, Mr. Richard. There's hope. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's our next viewer email. I have a pecan tree that the squirrels just love. Most of the time they chew on the pecans and then drop the remainder to go to waste. However, over the last three years, we find perfectly shelled pecans on the ground, no bite marks or anything. They look like they were shelled by a mechanical sheller. I will find a couple a day. What is going on? If we didn't live where we do, I would get rid of them by Mr. D's method. <laughs> Thanks, and this is from Jerry and Miss Dorothy in Portland. So they didn't live where they live, Mr. D. They will use your method. There are silent ways. <laughs> yeah. There are powerful BB guns oh, out there man. nowadays. <laughs> but I would, I would think that squirrels are doing that. I mean, have you ever been at a, a ball game, sitting there at the ball game, <laughs> eating peanuts, and you shell a peanut, and, and you get it's a big old peanut, and, and all of a sudden you drop one. Uh huh. You know, and and you know you're just getting ready to pop in your mouth. Uh -huh. Well, squirrels I've, I've are the same that. way. And I'll bet you, the reason they don't see many of those is because <laughs> most squirrels, when they drop a perfectly <laughs> good uh, pecan, they will go down the tree on their way out and grab it and eat it. You didn't pick it up. But I'll bet you, when they see one or two like that, they walked up under that tree. And they surprised Mr. Squirrel, and he got nervous, and oh, he, was, yeah. he was scooting away. He dropped, he dropped a, a pecan, and he's quiet now. He's up there, and he's he's, he's hiding from you, and and so that's probably what happened. Uh, but um, BB guns and pellet guns are uh, have, have have really technology has improved them quite a lot, and you might want to consider that. I mean, I mean, you just want to burn them, chase them away is all right. you can do, really, you know. Would that still require the 12-year-old, though? 
12 year old would help. <laughs> they, they have more patience and time on their hands. <laughs> All right, so Mr. Jerry, Ms. Dorothy, here you hear from Mr. D, right? 12 year old with a BB gun or a pellet gun. You know. <laughs> In, in, in urban environment. In urban environment. Yeah. That's right. Mr. D, we're out of time. It's always fun to have you here with us. I enjoy it. It's Appreciate always a pleasure. All right, thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. This is our last episode this growing season. We hope we helped you and your garden this year. We would like to thank all of our guests that came on the show this year and shared their gardening knowledge with us. We'll be back in March and hope to see you then. We are already planning some great shows. As always, you can go to familyplottogarden.com to see anything we've done in the last few years. I'm Chris Cooper. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, Merry Christmas, and Happy New Year. Be sure to join us next March for the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. Thank you and be safe. Test, right? We, we did. About we did soil, the right, right thing. We we practiced what we preached. That's right. right? So what, what does it look like? Well, it looks pretty good. You know, we 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 did the soil test this time. This time of the year is a good time to do okay. the soil test, even though this is not the time of the year to apply fertilizer. Okay. Uh, however, it is the time of the year to apply lime. Any time is the time to apply lime if you need it. So the main reason we went ahead and uh, checked the soil here is to try to determine whether or not we needed to adjust the pH any. Okay. Well, the pH. <laughs> It's 7.83, so oh, it's yeah. very high. We it's definitely high. do not need any lime. We have uh, almost 5,000 pounds of calcium per acre out here, which That's is plenty. highly sufficient, plenty. highly sufficient. Mm -hmm. But we do know now that we've done the soil test that next spring, when we before we plant the garden, we need to apply 15 pounds mm -hmm. of triple 15 per thousand square feet. Okay. Now we've measured this uh, and it is 25 feet long and 20 feet wide. Okay. So it just happens to be exactly 500 right square feet. Right. So we know that next spring we'll need to apply seven and a half pounds of triple 15 over this area okay. for vegetables. All That's right. what we need. Um, so uh, I think what we're going to do this year, in the upper part to my right is fairly dry. Mm -hmm. And so we are going to go ahead and apply some soil amendments okay. to that soil to open it up a little bit. This is 50% uh, cotton burr right. and 50% leaf litter, mm -hmm. I understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're going to put about three inches, a three inch cover and till it into the soil on the upper part. The lower part is really too wet for us to do anything with. And so we're going to, it's going to be a test. We're going to put our soil amendments out here in the fall on half of this 500 square feet. This lower half on the left, we're gonna leave it and let it just lay here all winter. Ah. And, and, and then we're going to uh, apply uh, the soil amendments here, you know, next spring, uh, early next spring okay. before we plant. Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in Mid-South, I'm Chris Cooper. It's the last episode of the growing season. If you're thinking about starting a garden next spring, now is a good time to start preparing the soil. Also, we're answering viewer questions. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mr. D. Howdy. Good to have you, Mr. D. It's great. Great day to be outside, man. It's beautiful. Nice day. day. Wonderful day. day. Guess what we're going to do today? We're going to play in the dirt. We're going to have a good time. Yeah. You ready for it? I'm ready. All right. I'm ready. We also did our soil. Pretty good, huh? It looks really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks really yeah. good. It ought, to, it ought to, I mean, organic matter on this soil was uh, 
2.61 percent so you know we would like to this will get it on up there if okay. we can get to five or six percent that would really really be good mm -hmm. uh, but we did learn that our phosphorus levels and potassium levels are medium which which is good, it's good. Yeah. Uh, uh, if, if we go with this triple 15 every year we will eventually have extremely high levels of phosphorus <laughs> so that's why we're gonna we're gonna follow this soil test report for about three or four years and then we're gonna retest and at that time I predict the recommendation will change from triple 15 to 13 0 13 or 15 0 15 hmm. I predict we will have built the levels of potassium up high enough that we won't need to add potassium okay. and we do that for through to it now what we've done to this area already about 10 days ago we uh, sprayed this area with glyphosate. Mm -hmm. The grass didn't completely turn brown. Mm -hmm. it, it yellowed right. up a little bit. And the reason is glyphosate is a systemic herbicide, you, you know, uh -huh. and yeah. it works best when plants are actively growing. Right. Well, in the last couple of weeks, we've had some cool nights and, and, and uh, cool weather. And so and the Bermuda grass, and the right. grass is kind of shutting down a little bit. It's still dead. Right. I mean, the, 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 the plant had taken up the glyphosate and so it's still dead. So you don't have to wait until it's completely brown if you do that, to, to, you know, apply it this time of the year. Okay. Then we went in here and tilled it yesterday, I think, is when we tilled it. Okay. And, uh, it and that's when we discovered that this is a little too wet to, yeah. to do anything <laughs> to. So, uh, uh, so that's what we've done so far. So I think what we're ready to do now is start applying this cotton burr and leaf litter mix. Yeah. Uh, we're going to.